from Barangaroo Studios, the AusBiz COV is the key stuff you need to know about the day in business and finance. Good afternoon, TGIF. This is the COB, all the stuff you need to know in the day in business and markets. My name is Kyle Rotter. I'm with Danny Akuye. Uh, let's see where we've closed the session, Danny, because it's Look, been a pretty, well, dour week is the, the term that I've been um, using. But well, we'll finish maybe on, on a slide high, up 0.3% for the session. Yeah, it looks like that way for the SIBO 200, ASX 200, maybe up five points. So pretty much mm. flat uh, at the moment, but we'll see how it updates over the course of the next 20 minutes. We really need to get to the bottom of uh, where the differences are in the composition of those I two indices, because there's every so often there's just a day they where align, it's just, yeah. It's, dong, and then other days they're like, There just must be one stock that's just the swing factor there. <laughs> I don't know what it is, but anyway, you can see there that uh, we are- Which is a bit bizarre, isn't it? Because anyway. It's a big difference, but we'll, we'll try and work it out for you because I'm sure there's some curious people at home as well. But um, let's just get now to the three themes for the day. And um, well, there's a few things going on out yes. there, but um, bond yield bite. Mm. A few factors, I think, that driving that story this week. But nevertheless, the fact of the matter is we've seen this big run up in long term rates that's uh, probably put some pressure on equity valuations, at least caused a few dislocations in the short term. And well, some steam coming out of this rally on Wall Street and obviously in uh, Australian stocks as well. Yeah, it looks like a little confluence of factors yeah. going on and, and the big investor, Bill Ackman, of course, has come out and said he's a shorted 30-year US Treasuries. Oh, Bill. Who knows? Yeah. Who knows? But at the end of the day, 4.19% on the two, the 10-year. Mm -hmm. And of course, people go, well, this is the highest it's been since ooh, October 2022. Yeah. So look, you know, sometimes whether or not it's what's going on in the markets, whether it's the move index, the bond volatility moving exactly. index, sometimes yeah. people just want to take some money off the table, take the profits. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes it's the rate of change, isn't it? I mean, again, stocks have run up very, very yeah. aggressively. Like and, crazy. Um, yeah. Bonds have moved really quickly. You know, yeah. people have to sort of reposition, reallocate and that can sometimes come with a little bit of volatility. So it's mm. nothing extreme, at least for now. So we'll just keep an eye on that theme. But um, a few other things today as well. Back to Target by 2025. Mm. The RBA statement of monetary policy mm -hmm. released today, and uh, we got an extra six months of forecast from the central bank going out to the end of 2025. Mm -hmm. And lo and behold, that's when they reckon inflation will get back no, miraculously. To target. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I just, think uh, it's such a bizarre thing. Yeah. Oh, we'll just get the fuck out. Woof. <laughs> yeah, there we go. I, it was a good quote that Stephen Cooler shared once. Was that. Uh, channeling Glenn Stevens and something he said is that uh, you should see the forecasts not as what the RBA thinks will happen but as a, won't. as a statement of intent because <laughs> if they're not setting policy right it means that you know they wouldn't be getting to, to that direction because that's where they want to go so yeah. anyway um, that's uh, more or less what we learned from the song there wasn't actually that much there in terms of market moving news um, but in terms of stocks and I think this sums things up a little bit not entirely because Amazon shut the lights out but it would seem but falling short of a high bar we did have the likes of ResMed, uh, mm. Block, even Apple to an extent yeah. where, you know, it was hard another, to, to Another beat quarter of declining revenue growth and mm. they're forecasting another quarter right. of uh, revenue contraction of 3%. Um, you know, it's, well, you know, it's debatable. I mean, other things are, are positive and mm. driving the bottom line, but revenues are still shrinking. Yeah, interesting. Uh, did you get across, because I know you, you, you're pretty um, keen to, to get up bright and early in the morning and, you know, you flick on your news and the Wall Street close and, Amazon reported as well, up 7% or so uh, after yeah, hours. Yeah, I was reading some different stuff, but it looks like um, AWS is slowing. So that yeah. was the trend that you saw with Microsoft. Um, yeah. But also on all that investment in logistics mm. and everything has started to pay off. Yeah. I also read that there was some strange stuff going on with depreciation because they're okay, extending. Okay, accounting tricks. I, I did read that, yeah, and then right. I went back to try and look at it again. So it looks like they've decreased the amount of depreciation on, on their computers, which I was assume they were referring to um, the AWS stuff. Um, yeah, right. Yeah, from, well, increased it, sorry, from four to five years. So in doing that, obviously, your depreciation charge comes down. Yeah, okay, so mm. devil's in the detail, perhaps. Mm. Nevertheless, it was up after hours and maybe supporting just a little bit. Uh, futures, US futures uh, in after hours trade briefly anyway. We'll have to see how we wrap up the end of the week. There's still a lot to go ahead. Uh, we spoke about ResMed before. Um, the news there was a noteworthy 18% rise in revenue amounting to $4.2 billion for the entire financial year. Um, but falling short perhaps of a reasonably high bar once again. And um, as I understand it too, ResMed has a bit of a history 
of missing expectations. Yeah, it does. I've, I've noticed over the last few quarters it definitely gets slammed. But the, the, the issue there is that margins, the gross margin continues to come under pressure. So, you know, it, it, it's, it's struggling to gain traction at the moment. Um, anyway, we've got more details on that because it is stock of the day as ah, well. Yes, of course, and you were, uh, you were chairing that uh, to this, uh, today's episode as well. Um, also some big news today, the ACCC rejected ANZ's proposed takeover of Suncorp's banking arm, um, as one would imagine, uh, more or less on the grounds that it, would, it was not satisfied. It, <laughs> would reduce, uh, would substantially, sorry, the deal would not substantially reduce competition. It's, so such, it's such a bizarre thing, isn't it, right? Yeah. So you consolidate yeah. and it's it's not going to reduce competition. Yeah, yeah. I it's, mean, <laughs> it's just like, isn't that the basic law that as soon as you consolidate industries, you have less players, then you have less competition. That, that, that would be the axiom, I suppose. <laughs> um, apparently, ANZ can, uh, uh, is intending to contest the decision, yeah, of course they are, and will uh, will continue to prepare for the integration of both businesses there. And interesting too, I know we spoke about it yesterday. Um, you know, Paul Brennan just obviously, you know, talking uh, typically about the economic scene, but he's obviously uh, a big player in um, in SunCorp and just the fact that they've got to report earnings in a couple of weeks too. So uh, it's a very bu busy time for mm. for the bank to try and you know does, doesn't necessarily know whether it'll you know be. The business as it is right now in, in, in a few weeks or, or something very, very different. So it's going to be hard to provide guidance there perhaps for, for Suncorp just mm. in the short term. So a bit of uncertainty for investors. But um, Danny, stock of the day, it was Resmed. It was indeed. Yes. And uh, I had Luke Winchester and uh, Claude Walker on from A Rich Life. And uh, yeah, they shared their thoughts on Resmed. I think as a business, the outlook is still, you know, quite good. Top line revenue growth was still 23%, still really strong. Um, but the market reaction to me is actually quite rational. And I think it's worth people who, who own ResMed just taking a look at that gross margin and thinking to themselves, you know, can this get back to the 56, 57%? Because even that one to 2% percentage points, you know, is, is quite a big, a, quite a big um, hit to the bottom line with a, a revenue base like ResMed's. Um, so look, you and I've only had a quick look today, I, I would say a hold for people, but, but just be aware that valuation is high. Um, and you need that that turnaround or that execution to come back pretty quickly to support that. So this could be a little bit like CSL, which we'll talk about later, um, where it, it it may just drift downwards for a while. So um, I, I will say a hold, but but uh, for people to to look a bit deeper into this result, I think there's more to it than just an earnings miss. In uh, blue chip, slightly defensive, long term growth at a reasonable price thesis still probably does hold here. So it's not something you need to be selling. Having said that, uh, it is a hold for me just because. I'd prefer have a little more. I think some of the risk is skewed to the downside just because of that other factor where it probably the quality of this company's positioning is no longer improving. And, and what you really want if you're focused on quality growth kind of style investing is you want companies that are improving their quality, which often comes through margins and, and usually a better uh, competitive positioning over time. And given that we're probably not seeing that here, that's what keeps it in a hold zone for me. So a couple of holds there. A couple of holds, absolutely. Okay, yeah. well there you go. That's uh, the call there on ResMed. But let's get to our guest for the episode now. And I'm glad to say to wrap up the week for us, George Baboris from K2 Asset Management is standing by. George, uh, great to see you. I hope you've had a wonderful week. Um, I mean, it's hard to go past the ructions, if you will, in the bond market uh, this week as you know reasons for, for fairly significant volatility in equities, or at least a little bit of a pickup. So how have you assessed things as an asset manager? What do you think some of the drivers here are of uh, price action? Yeah, the price action that we've observed is pretty much how you discuss the first five minutes uh, of your segment. A number of moving parts, but the let's just start. The stigmas of the yield curve are so severe for 210s, 230s in the US that that was a high predictor, all things being equal, of a, an aggressive hard landing in North America. However, the data for eight weeks and I think we've been consistent in that the data increasingly over eight weeks has, have, has reaffirmed that the high probability of the soft landing will eventuate, which has been engineered by the Fed, which in itself is impressive, and earnings are reflecting that, et cetera. But the steepness was still there, it was quite extreme, uh, pointing towards that hard landing, which is at odds to 
future earnings expectations and credit conditions, again, because of the tight labour market. So here we are, call whatever reason you want, and you've highlighted the few that I think you mentioned the move index, the volatility uh, the two, of, the, of the implied yield of the curve in the US, and that's at odds with uh, the VIX index. Uh, but let's just point towards the Fitch uh, you know, shot above the bow. Please be cognizant of your spending going forward relative to your obligations. And that was enough for the, uh, the sell-off and the long bond yields or the steepness to be reversed. And that's, that is the same thing as saying we're going for the soft landing in a different way. Uh, and therefore, again, I think you mentioned, Kyle, that would be a headwind for equity valuations, all things being equal. They are, as you adjust to in the next few weeks. But the thing to reinforce is soft landing is probable. Therefore, soft landing equals higher cash rates in the US, Europe, UK and Australia for longer. Pricing in a rate cut is very drives a good equity valuation, but don't expect the rate cuts to come anytime soon. They've got to do a bit more demand disruption. Inflation is tamed, keeping inflation index around the same in the US, sees things fall towards the band by next year. So it's all working its way and it's just a bit of a readjustment, a recalibration there. So that's how we look at it. So cautiously optimistic as we have been through this, this rally since uh, October of last year, because there's more predictability, soft landing again equals higher cash rates for longer. And again, uh, the yield curve uh, reversing that extreme steepness suggests that is now going to be more predictive of that soft landing, more in line with the equity market. But it's all uneven, remember? Mm. Yeah, George, um, look, the US, obviously, um, the, the current administration is, is spending a lot of money. And that's, you know, Fitch has, is, you know, pointed that out, etc. the budget deficit, Inflation Reduction Act. If we, if we compare that back home to Australia, um, we don't have such a large fiscal spending program here. Yes, there are some issues around um, the minimum wage rises that come through, the changes in the, 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 the labour um, rates, etc. that they've just announced. Uh, but that statement of monetary policy from the RBA that we saw, 0.9% GDP growth for this year, signs that, you know, well, the consumer's under pressure, I know that we're comparing ourselves to the US about this sort of soft landing, no landing thing, but I was speaking to a lender to SMEs and he was saying they are really struggling at the moment. So do you think our, inflate, our employment numbers are masking what is actually an erosion going on at the moment in terms of the Australian uh, economy? Yeah, blimey, how long is a piece of string? The unevenness to the Australian economy is a bit more amplified versus, say, North America. That's first and foremost. Quickly going through some of the questions. The federal government, AAA rated, say, nine sovereigns around the world, AAA rated. It's very supportive of corporate profits. The corporate profits are, are, have been revised each month as we go. So that's a good case for Canberra. The state government, semi-governments or provincial bonds equivalents offshore, they're deteriorating at a rapid rate. Look at the state of Victoria, for example, they've got to cut back on costs in an extreme way, tax households more aggressively, et cetera, just to, just to get on top of the rating agency so they don't get another double notch downgrade. They got reaffirmed, of course, and they're delivering these adjustments. But in Australia, there's this in, uh, implicit link to a federal guarantee. It's not there, but that's what people do. And that's why the uh, three tens are very steep uh, in Victoria for the TCB sort of government bond program relative to the federal, which is very flat. So. So there is an unevenness to the Australian economy, unlike uh, and more amplified than the US. Uh, the other side to look at very quickly is that the labour market is broadly tight and there is no productivity gains. You can't have that discussion in the broad media, but in, as fund managers, we have the discussion there's no productivity gains for multi decades in this Australian economy and what's going on is not conducive to it, but nevertheless, you've got to prosecute that case that it adds to uh, efficiencies. But, uh, but the, and then the, uh, and look at the consumer sentiment in Australia. Is at recessionary levels. Consumer sentiment in North America are not at they're low and lower than where they've been, but they're not at recessionary levels. But these ones are very amplified. So household consumer sentiment, recessionary levels. Uh, business sentiment in Australia, depressed levels. Business conditions are not depressed in aggregate, and household savings ratios in aggregate, yes, it's, it, it masks the uneven, uh, the unevenness of it, are holding up. But a third of households are quick, clearly going to go into a stress situation as we keep hearing about the mortgage cliff between sometime to now and at a year, sometime mid next year. And that's why going back to the RBA, keeping it at 4.1% uh, 
and holding it lower, higher for longer uh, reinforces the soft landing outlook. It's not perfect, but it's not a recession. You can argue a per capita recession. Uh, but in there, there's enough aggregate earnings to go into your portfolios to reaffirm uh, as the demand destruction continues. So again, higher for longer, soft landing in Australia, and the wealth effect for some households get worsens all things being equal. But then having said all of that, you wouldn't, you wouldn't, what I've just said in the last two minutes, you wouldn't touch consumer discretionary, but JB Hi-Fi will find a way to extract good value for shareholders within that. So you can still find uh, gems within something that's quite distressed with unevenness in there. So I've said a lot again, uh, but again, it, it reaffirms that we've always been for the soft landing narrative, and that's more predictive. If it's more predictive where we were, you should price earnings a bit more comfort one year forward in credit conditions. And therefore, that soft landing equals that just just high discount rates. We've got higher headwinds with our equity valuations relative to where we were before the rate rises and just get comfortable to about that, that messaging and that story. Just uh, turning to the upcoming reporting period domestically, and of course, we've had a, a sort of a trickle of uh, results coming through already, but really picks up in the next few weeks. Uh, we talk about valuations and sort of companies maybe in the states having trouble meeting the higher bar set, especially in the tech sector. I, I did notice though that multiples, at least trailing price to earnings near ASX 200, is actually below 10-year uh, averages or so, which would be sort of suggestive of a market that's you know discounting perhaps weaker growth going forward. So, I mean, where are we set up going into this reporting period locally? I mean, do we face maybe the reverse situation that you know already maybe a lot of bad news is priced in or a lot of pessimism? So. You know, perhaps we can hope for some upside here. What's what's your view? Yeah, a, a good question. The relativity of earnings in Australia relative to the US is a bit more depressed. Again, uh, link, linking to the sentiment indicators in Australia relative to the sentiment indica indicators in the US. Yes, one of the sentiment indicators for someone out there is is equity indice prices. One of 10, 10 inputs is because the leading indicator. So taking that as, as noted. Mm. Uh, but, but, so, so, but, but the equity market here is really going to be influenced by the net interest margins of the big four banks. Yeah. Uh, they're decreasing at a decreasing rate, which is good. Uh, obviously, one's trying to merge to assist that narrative. It's a bit oligopolistic. But, uh, but, but the financials are holding up. And the resource sector, just look at costs with the resource sector, given they're such an aggregate contributor uh, to the earnings profile. And then there's a small part of the Australian uh, uh, equity bourse that's small or mid-cap. Uh, so small in market cap relative to the major top 50, but that's the sensitivity to the economy. It's yeah. been travelling at depressed valuations for some time, and we can see some the soft landing should be beneficial to them in a relative sense going into this reporting period. Uh, again, in, in North America, uh, yes, it's the narrowest rally for 30 years, uh, but, and there's been good robust capex in cloud over the past four or five years and AI. And uh, that's quite robust, and you can't translate over in Australia. But 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 generally, it's all about. No one's going to get too much guidance in Australia. But lower bar to beat in Australia for the earnings period. Again, re reinforcing business and household sentiment, consumer sentiment is much lower here relative to the US. Uh, but I think uh, they'll steer through it. Uh, again, we'll, soft landing, the demand destruction going through the economy is there. But there's some pricing power, for example, with Coles and Woolies. And there's, uh, there's some, as the ACCC reinforced today, there's some potential pricing power with Suncorp and ANZ as an example. But generally, yes, we're more depressed going into earnings relative to the US, and therefore uh, we may surprise by meeting expectations or slightly holding up. Fantastic, George. Well, that is certainly a lovely thought to leave on uh, this Friday afternoon into the run up to the weekend. Thank you so much for taking time out to join Ausbiz this afternoon. Uh, good to be with you. Cheerio. George Baboris here from K2 Asset Management sharing, uh, well, obviously a bit of a top-down view there, which is, well, fantastic on a week like this, of course. Um, let's get to the leaders and laggards now, shall we? Starting off with the leaders. And um, what do we got here? Oh, Domino's. Oh, Domino's is back about 50 bucks a share. Maybe starting to bottom out there a little bit, perhaps. A bit of bottom fishing, maybe. Yeah, Treasury Hope. Wine, Hope up, it, yeah. Tadcorp, higher, and up, and up. Looks like bottom fishing to me, but hey, what would I know? No, 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 your guess is as good as mine, and in fact, it's even better. Um, laggards now, let's have a look at uh, what we've got going there. Mesoblast. Oh, Mesoblast. Smoked. <laughs> smoked. I'm sorry if you own it, but it's smoked. It was. Uh, it didn't get FDA approval no. from a drug that I'm not going to even attempt to try and say without no. it in front of me. Uh, but really disappointing there, obviously, and, you know, I guess it's um, sort of caveat emptor. 
when you're talking yeah. about some of these Ouch. names. It, they, they can move pretty hard on, yeah. on, on these sorts of news to the upside and to the downside. So unfortunately for Mesoblast, the company and, uh, its, and its shareholders, um, a pretty difficult day there, down 56%. Uh, otherwise, it's going through the list there. No, I don't know anything. I just checked EML, nothing announced there, but uh, you know they've also had major, major headwinds over in Ireland, so. Yeah. yeah, and uh, some commodity names did struggle today. I think gold may have even struggled a little yeah. bit too. Just well, those we bond are yields seeing, are going yeah. in the wrong direction. Yeah, US dollars up just a, a, a tad as well. Yep. So um, yeah, some headwinds there, just uh, very, very short term. Uh, let's get to the leaders and laggards at the smaller end there of the market. It is City Chic. Tell and us about it. Yeah, so it really interesting because Michael Frazis was talking about this on Tuesday. So mm. anybody that listened to Michael and he said they just need to keep on cleaning up their balance sheet and getting rid of some of their inventories and lo and behold they've divested its Evans business and EMEA inventory via an asset sale and uh, so of course the the market has greeted that with open arms because they've been suffering they've got big revenues but they've got this inventory to clear so uh, they're going to receive eight million pounds for that and uh, I think net consideration about 6.4 million pounds or 12 million dollars so um, yeah and what are they doing they will look to you know shore up their balance sheet so very positive yeah, okay. So there you go, 27% higher. And maybe, again, another stock that's recently an inflection point, or I suppose for shareholders. It's so bombed out. I mean, it was yeah. down, it must be down 95% plus. Yeah, indeed. Uh, there you go, uh, the bottom end of the market there for the small plus. caps. Um, nothing actually profound there in the context of things. You know, you expect uh, these sorts of moves when you're uh, a small cap investor. So, Pantoro, I'm not too sure what it does, but the biggest lag out of the day there, down 10, more than 10% um, on, uh, on the session. All right, let's get to what's happening tonight because it's going to be pretty big. Um, US Pales. earnings, oh, dearie me, um, obviously having a few issues there, but... Um, uh, payrolls. Payrolls, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a big one. That. They could have a lot of um, bond volatility or market volatility just generally around yeah, that. Yeah, well, I, I, it was a little bit like a, a, a rinse and repeat really from last <laughs> month because we had the same dynamic emerge yeah, where... ADP the, was strong yeah, and then yeah. the payrolls weren't so bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think everyone got kind of worked up and obviously really hedged themselves going into, you know, potentially an F, mm. NFP surprise. And it became, it was roughly in line and everyone mm. kind of moved on for, for, from that. But uh, expectations, jobless rates remain at about 3.6%, mm -hmm. 200 odd jobs added. Yeah. Uh, but the most important thing will be average hourly earnings, which really has moderated over mm. the course of sort of six, or months, mm. uh, six months or so, um, which, you know, brings sort of obviously the balance between wages and inflation, um, you know, back in line a little bit more. So that'll be, that'll be significant. Um, also some Canadian employment data too, and mm -hmm. you know, obviously the Bank of Canada, especially for, for currency traders, if that's, your, if that's your thing, that could be influential because not necessarily a job done there when it comes to Canada and its inflation struggle. Um, the day, or sorry, I should say the week ahead, uh, also going to be really significant. Earnings is going to be big. Yes, These, look at I those. mean, it's a deluge. So I picked five because you know I can only some big fit ones. so many in the screen. But CBA, AGL already coming out with some sort of dirty laundry. But um, yeah, it should be should be pretty fascinating. Yeah, absolutely. REA, AMP. Yeah. Well, anyway, and James Hardy. And you talk about um, well potential bond market ructions, China inflation data, and U.S. CPI and PPI. Oh, where oh that Tuesday again. Yeah, it's, Tuesday C uh, CPI. Yeah, it's it's going to be um, it's going <laughs> to be pretty interesting. Yeah, yeah, it comes around quick, doesn't it? It does come um, around quickly, and of course there is a high. Uh, sorry. A, the, the base effect is what has concerned some commentators. Yeah, yeah. Well, that it had already. Out now. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, um, and China inflation data will be too interesting too because from a I guess technical point of view, if it comes in lower on a CPI on the from from the CPI perspective, that that would mark you know I guess what you would say the definition of deflation. Correct. I mean, it would be it would be negative price growth. So yep. both could be really really fascinating stuff. So it, it, needless to say, it's it's going to be a pretty big week. But this was a big week too, and we probably should put an end to it now because we've uh, been rambling on a bit, but it's um, plenty to talk about, Danny. Um, ASX 200 up uh, almost 14 points, 0.2%, yeah. 7,325. There's a SIBO 200 up 0.3%, 4.2 points. 
So we managed a green on screen end to the week, which I would say is a Friday type of moment. Yeah, you're a glass, glass up full type of person. We're a little bit lower for the week, of course, but uh, anyway, it was actually not such a big drawdown uh, when all things are said and done, despite some pretty um, negative days. But nevertheless, uh, if you've got a bit of time on your weekend, you can catch up on everything that we did this week on our website and app. Otherwise, do have a lovely weekend and we'll see you Monday morning. Bye. <laughs>